Hello, and welcome to today's episode of IPSA Live. Today we are joined by Colonel Bingham and Sergeant First Class Lingerfelt to talk about mill pay and absence, as well as show you a new mobile video and a system demo. Before we start, a reminder that a copy of today's slides can be found on our IPSA website, and we've also posted a link in the chat. Colonel Bingham, passing the mic to you, sir. Thank you, I appreciate it. I'm Colonel Boyd Bingham. I am the IPSA Release 3 lead and also known as the SIC, the Synchronization Integration Coordinator for IPSA, all things. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through a few things really quickly and then uh, turn it over to Sergeant Lingerfeld. If we can go on to the next slide, please. So what you see in front of you right now is uh, our quad chart. We call it our bullseye chart. It really breaks down what IPSA capabilities are going to be delivered as we go live. Many of you have seen this um, probably throughout other forums, but I'm just going to go over it really quickly. In front of you, you have uh, three modules really make up IPSA. So you have the ELM, which is the Enterprise Learning Management Tool. And that's where everybody's going to go into the system and do their training uh, before they'll be granted access into the system. As you look at the upper left side there, you see Customer Relations Module. This is the area where soldiers, HR professionals, and commanders We'll be able to submit trouble tickets, track actions, and submit soldier inquiries as the system goes live. It's also where if you're having access problems, you'll submit trouble tickets to our help desk so we can go through and figure out and troubleshoot that. Moving over to the HR support, which falls under the human capital management module. This is where you'll spend most of your time as an HR professional. It's really where soldiers will do all their actions inside of the system and where commanders will go into work workflow and do other actions for approving promotions, transfers, duty statuses, so and so forth. This is really the bulk of what we do as an HR community, and this is where it's all going to happen. So inside of this module, we're going to be talking today about absences, and that falls inside this, absent, this module as well. Uh, along with how duty status changes when those absences occur. Moving just down on the bottom part of that slide really quick, we have uh, business analytics. That's part of the H HCM tool, and that's really where a lot of your reports today that you have to go into, uh, pull those out of data store, out of emailpo, or going into Topness and Web EDAS. That's where we're going to capture a lot of those analytics that you use in your S1 shops today. Then moving over to talent management, this is where we're going to capture all of the data that relates to a soldier and how we're going to report that data to commanders and senior leaders across the Army. So, so moving on, I'll, uh, we'll go on to a, a really quick video and, and then I'll pick it up and turn it over to Sergeant Lingerfeld. <laughs> I'm Sergeant First Class Martinez. You know what it's like to wait in line, sometimes for hours at the S1 shop, or be told to come back later, just to do things like update your personnel record, check your promotion points, submit personnel actions like leave requests, and fix pay issues? It's not fun and not the best use of your time. So that's changing. You've heard of IPSA, right? The new system that will do personnel and pay for the whole army? Yeah, that thing. So it's kind of a big deal. And they've made an IPSA app so that you can do all those things you'd normally have to do at the S1 shop right from your phone. So for the first time, you could submit a leave request and then be able to track its status all from your phone, no matter where you are, whether you're at work, at home, wherever, just like you would do anything else on your phone. All you need to do is install the IPSA app on your phone. If you haven't already, install the Tag Mobile app from Tradoc on your phone. You gotta do that first. Once you're inside the Tag Mobile app, search for the IPSA app, install it, and then you're set. If you need help finding the Tradoc app gateway, I've got a link down in the description below, along with more detailed instructions. Be in control of your own soldier record. I'll see you later. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Sergeant Jesse Lingerfelt. He has been our our main effort when it comes to leading the finance build in in IPSA and is really the subject matter expert in the program right now dealing with pretty much all things finance. So Sergeant Lingerfelt, over to you. 
Hey, sir. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm starting Lingerfeld. Uh, and I work as the R3 mill pay functional lead in the design and development section of FMD. Really trying to work through like our pay processes, uh, building out front end and back end user stuff, uh, as well as uh, ensuring that we are integrating uh, HR and pay together correctly. Right. Uh, which kind of leads me to this first slide. Uh, it's, it's kind of a simple slide, but um, you know, very true. HR drives pay, and that's, that's uh, true yesterday, true today, and uh, as we move into IPSA, it's uh, even more real and true there. Um, so, you know, kind of as HR professionals, our members submit special pay requests, uh, their leave transaction PARs, they're put on assignments, and that stuff is approved, uh, it should update or trigger and update a member's pay record. And uh, so in release two, we're, we're currently doing that with the Army National Guard with 26 different uh, transactions that we send to DJMS RFC, uh, which is through a 80 character uh, our data character called a 10. Uh, in release three, we're actually gonna add two more to that. So we'll have 28 tens total. Uh, and we're going to have nine FIDs, uh, which really translates to 36 different formats um, for pay transactions that we're sending for our regular Army uh, and AGR personnel to DGMS AC. Um, and then, you know, looking forward to release four. Uh, this is actually where we kind of off ramp from DGMS uh, AC and RC. Uh, we have what's called our global payroll engine within IPSA. Uh, that will look at your HR data, um, kind of capture pay based on that, uh, and then we disperse your your uh, funds directly through Treasury uh, to pay you individually. So uh, a lot of stuff happening in here on the program, um, moving big things, uh, and, and enjoying it all. So if we can move to the next slide. Okay. Yep. So. Looking at the uh, uh, future in mind, right? So we're building out release three. Uh, we want to make sure the stuff that we're doing in release three supports release four functionality as well, right? So our HR uh, side of the house that we're fixing now uh, and that we built that it will support global payroll functionality to capture pay in R4. And that's what we do with the risk reduction event. So we've we built some of the GP. Uh, engine rules uh, through previous RRE uh, events. And we are running scenarios, uh, real time scenarios, to ensure as we are updating the member's HR record, uh, we're actually calculating your pay correctly. Great example is we put a member on assignment to Afghanistan and arrive them, right? We start automatically, we trigger their imminent danger pay, uh, hardship duty pay. Uh, depending on their dependent structure and their profile, we'll trigger family separation allowance. We automatically kick on the combat zone tax exclusion. Um, and this is all just based on an assignment arrival and transaction, right? It's not multiple different transactions happening at once. Um, it's, it's based off of your HR record and real time calc of your pay. Uh, real big stuff happening. All right, so. You know, we just got done talking about like RE and how that's going to work in release four, um, but we we're bridging the gap in release two and release three where uh, we still work with DJMS, AC and RC and interface uh, certain pay transactions to uh, DJMS. And we want to do this based on your HR record uh, and approved transactions that happen in IPS not having to do uh, second and third order transactions outside of the system. And we do that with a, a rules engine that we developed called DJMS Framework. Um, and as your HR record updates, right, based on specific assignments, your person profile, your duty status, uh, we capture those actions that have happened. We generate these 80 character uh, DJMS data format uh, transactions and then we send them directly to your pay record to update uh, the following day uh, in our DJMS interface. So uh, there's not a real big lag in between 
uh, your HR record being updated and your pay record being updated, and it helps keep everything uh, together. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Yeah, so here, um, the list on the left, that's your FIDs. Um, again, we have nine FIDs. Um, the bulk of those are like your person profile stuff, your, your name, your grade, uh, your duty status, but we also have parachute pay uh, and SDAP in there as well that we interface directly with DJMS. Again, it's nine FIDs, but really it's about 36 different formats when you take into account how DJMS AC works uh, with being able to start, stop, change, correct transactions as they happen. Uh, and then here on the right, you see the 28 tens that were sent into DJMS RC. Uh, you know, 26 of those that were sent in and released to now. And in the bottom two, you see the memo transaction and the leave transaction that we're adding for release three. Uh, again, I just want to, you know, say again, like this is not three or four or five different people having to do this at once. Uh, you know, as the HR professional is updating your record uh, and it, that transaction is approved by the approval authority, you know, our framework is picking this up directly and automatically updating your uh, DJMS record. Okay, let's um, move to the next slide. Okay, yeah, so this, this leads us into, you know, a pretty big topic. Uh, every time we demo this thing, lots of discussion, which is always great. But uh, uh, so for release three, we're bringing in absence management. And essentially, this is going to replace the need to do a paper DA31 outside of the system. It's all internal into the system, how you work it. Uh, and what's really great about this is how accessible it is. So, you know, today you go to work, you do your DA31, you save it to your computer, you attach it to an email and send it to your supervisor for recommendation. They forward it to the S1 to then go to the commander. A bunch of emails and saving and signing and a whole bunch of stuff there. But, you know, with uh, if say you're going to go into the system and you can still use your work computer, of course, but you will be able to do this from home with your personal computer. Or what's even uh, bigger, in my opinion, is I can go on my phone uh, and request leave there or iPad or tablet, whatever kind of de device uh, that you would like to use there. Uh, you can request leave it workflows to your supervisor for uh, review or approval. And then uh, if a secondary approval is necessarily, it all happens within the system, right? And then we also have the capability to uh, print your leave form to support uh, other functions like your travel voucher. Uh, other countries have certain SOFA agreements that require you to carry a physical leave form with you to enter that country and we, we also have that to be able to do that. But you could also pull it up on your phone as well and show to them there. Um, so, you know, release three, right? We, we have that, but really it's, we can request any type of leave that is in law, reg or policy right now, uh, kind of bucketed into three different things, chargeable absence, non-chargeable absence and administrative absence. And we interface all of these uh, absence requests to DJMS uh, at the end of your leave for release three. Uh, and that way, you know, for our, our members that are in the barracks that have meal collections, they go on leave and they're not supposed to have those meal collections for that time, or they're entitled to some of their BAQ back, uh, you know, it quickly refunds that money back to them. They don't have to wait months or, uh, you know, weeks or months. No more like really leave forms getting lost here. And then release four, this is when we become the authoritative source for balances uh, where we count pay based off of absences. And you'll also gain the ability to uh, sell leave as well. And we'll disperse that money directly to you through our treasury direct also. Uh, yeah, again, so these are, you know, the buckets of leave, chargeable, non-chargeable, administrative. Uh, pretty self-explanatory here. Uh, this really allows us to uh, account for the specific type of leaves that are taken uh, by a member because sometimes stuff gets grouped together and it shouldn't. Um, but this way you can really see who is taking the non-chargeable primary caregiver, secondary caregiver leave, right? Uh, lots of analytics uh, capability here based on 
having these type of leaves tracked in the system. Yeah, so I'm going to kind of go through this one a little bit quicker. Uh, we go into more detail in the next slide, but this is essentially how your absence request looks in IPSA. So when you go to the page, these are all the data elements that are there. Um, you know, some key points here. Again, it's mobile capable. Uh, you as the member can self-service request this leave through here, or if there's an emergency situation and you need to leave quickly, um, you can have an HR professional uh, or a supervisor request the leave on your behalf. Uh, keep in mind, it's still got to go through approval uh, and, or review and approval. They can't just put it in and it happen. Uh, and then we have the standardized geolocation here in the bottom. And really, we'll kind of talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. So let, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Yeah, so again, this is your absence request here. Um, you see in the top section, that's uh, basically the type of leave that you have. Uh, the days that you're requesting, requesting start end date. Uh, and then something key here, right? You got your status approved. Um, you as a member can go in and see if it's still pending, if it was denied. Uh, approved, canceled, uh, and you also get email notifications and uh, dashboard notifications on this as it's happening in real time. Uh, and then let's, in the middle section, you have your date of departure, date of return. Uh, these are like signing in and out of leave. It also gives you the capability to account for non-duty days, um, or I'm sorry, returning on non-duty days, or if you work more than half a day, on your uh, departure date or expected departure date, then you can adjust that so you don't get charged that day and still leave uh, for leave on that day there. You need supervisor ID, um, so that's a look up glass. You click on that and it pulls up everybody in your department uh, and the department higher, higher than you that has authority uh, and the role to approve absences. So you can have a list of um, supervisors that you can actually route that to and as you click submit it automatically workflows to their inbox um, for either again review or approval and then you know on the bottom standard stuff right name telephone address it's on your leave form today nothing super fancy uh, but our geoloc our geolocation code that you see there under address line three uh, this is a standardized location code indicator uh, that is required field in the request. And this is really to be able to find members where they're on leave. So if they go to Palm Beach, Florida, and there's a hurricane coming that way, you as a commander HR professional can quickly run a query for everybody in that geo code or Palm Beach, Florida, and know where they're at. And the reason we use that really is because if you do a query for West Palm Street like that, you'll pull up everybody at West Palm Street, but you probably wouldn't pull everybody that does West Palm ST, right? So there's differences on how you can type this stuff in where the geoloc code, uh, quick look up and search is standardized and helps you find that stuff there. Uh, and then of course we can add attachments uh, for your handy dandy uh, trips report and if you need to do that. And then uh, LES is if uh, still required or any kind of additional information that you want to add to that uh, for the approver to see. Um, let's go to the next slide. Hey, just uh, Sergeant Lingerfield, there might be a few questions in there uh, just to address those. Um, oh, okay. Let me uh, go in here and look. Specifically, can you submit a chargeable or non-chargeable chargeable and non-chargeable leave form on the same form or does it have to be separate? Yeah, so great question. Right now, they have to be a uh, separate request. They are not combinable. Uh, PeopleSoft is working on an update to be able to do that in the future. It's just not uh, inherent within the system now. Great. And also, is there an or what is the authoritative source um, for the geolocation codes? Yep. So we pull in the, uh, I'm going to hopefully not mess this up, DTOD uh, location tables. 
and we matched them between the GeoLoc code that PeopleSoft uses, so they match with each other. That's it for the leaf forms. Thanks. Uh -huh. So, so uh, sorry, just a couple of things. There, uh, there were some questions on some slides earlier. Um, one was referring to the packet in and DJMS and the UICs, uh, how that was going to work. So th the question was, uh, so the on station and UIC triggers that the packet in that triggers the packet in and DJMS is the UIC and packet in mapped in this uh, SIA. And what happens when a DUIC is registered that is not aligned to a packet in? Yeah, great question. Um, so for you know DJMS RC and AC work a little bit differently. We do update the UIC for DJMS RC for AC. Uh, our own station or present for duty transaction uh, is really to work in conjunction with our AWOL and confinement transactions, right? So as we move people to uh, from AWOL back to present for duty is why we use that specific transaction. Your uh, arrival transaction or packing in update in DJMS will still work the same way it is today. So as you in process, they'll update that there. Now we are working with um, DFAS now to one, clean up these packing in tables uh, to then match the corresponding AOS uh, structure. So our department IDs or UICs within IPSA will match their um, packing in IDs as well and will hopefully help us bridge the gap in a 3.x environment where we can actually send those transactions and they'd be the same. And as you know, these department IDs go away or update or change, we'll be in sync with them uh, to ensure that the transaction is successful. OK, and just a couple of more that came up earlier uh, when the FIDS and TIN slide was up on the TINs. Uh, on that slide specifically dealing with the TINs, there were duplicate titles like um, TSP mailing address is listed three times. Uh, can you explain why that is on there? There's three different TINs for a T TSP mailing address change. Yeah, so. Uh, you know, I, I grew up with DJMS and coding it, and I love it, and it's great. Uh, but it was de developed in 1960s, 1970s, uh, and that specific transaction uh, is your mailing address for your TSP, and each line of that transaction updates the corresponding line in DJMS RC. So it is actually required to send three transactions to update your full mailing address for your TSP information there. So that's why we have three of those transactions. OK, and then just one more and then we can move on. And that was the. Um, is there an interface with AdPass? To update, you, you, you know how AdPass. <laughs> everybody on the line probably knows how AdPass works with email po. It's not very good. So yeah. as as we we move forward and and I can't recall if we're interfacing with AdPass directly, um, but is, is it interfaced and will it give more actionable in information to commanders? Yeah, so no, um, we're not interfacing with uh, AdPass directly uh, with absences. We, we've discussed it a lot. Uh, you know, eventually if we can get there, it'd be great. Uh, but that's kind of why we use this geolope code to be able to uh, be able to know where these uh, members are, kind of like AdPass would let you know and track people uh, is why we added that there, but we just don't integrate with them yet. Um, of course, as we go through design and development for release four, uh, that would be something that we'll discuss there and, and potentially add that down the road. And last, last one, certainly failed. I, this is actually a pretty good question. So, um, and I can talk to some of it. it it was what if uh, the leave type is not in IPSA, in the IPSA system? So um, th there are set types of leave you can take, and Sergeant Lingerfield can cut me off if I'm, I'm BSing my way through this. But um, we went through the different scenarios that an individual could take leave, and based on the information available to us with the regulations and policies and what PeopleSoft software allowed us to do. We narrowed that down and kind of bucketed different types of leaves 
into those three categories that you saw earlier in the slide. So all those different types of absences out of those, we're going back and looking at policy and regulation to align that there, uh, those different types of lead, but we've captured those different absences and you basically have to bucket one of your absence, whatever that absence is going to be, into one of those different uh, absent categories uh, to submit a leave form. There will be no paper leave forms. It, you'll just have to bucket it in there. Is that correct, Sergeant Linkerfeld? Yeah, it is. Um, so, you know, we worked with uh, HQDA policy. We worked with our HRC 600-8-10 um, uh, reg holder there that manages the leave uh, policies from their standpoint uh, and then we pulled additional laws um, that kind of bucket these leaves here and we added them up there shouldn't be any missing and I mean that's part of our testing now too to make sure that we don't miss that stuff um, now some of the names could be just a little bit different because you know a lot of people are used to taking permissive TDY uh, but that's not necessarily the correct name there uh, it would be more like house hunting or uh, another type of administrative uh, leave action. Um, but based on LRP uh, that exists today, they're all in there. There are some like off the wall uh, transition type for confinement stuff that are handled a little bit differently uh, and not necessarily done through absence management, but through like disciplinary actions. Uh, but as far as uh, leave itself, uh, we worked pretty close with all the key stakeholders there, including uh, DFAS, and ensured that we had all those types there. Uh, and if it's if for a reason a new one does populate or come up, um, really we design the absence um, to be integral, and it's not very difficult to new reason. Um, you know, granted that they they of course have to be real. They have to be an L. Uh, we can't just make them up off of nothing. But yeah, so it it would be easy to do. We could uh, add the rules and everything with you know a day and have it ready to the field, no problem. I think that catches us all up on questions, Sergeant Lingerfeld. If you want to continue on, yeah, of course. This is kind of a little bit more uh, at least the top section of the leave request there right you see the request history uh, this is where you know you as the member I know uh, young Linger felt used to uh, not know where my leave request was for a long time uh, and it would be like 24 hours before I would have to go on leave and no one knew where it was and I'd have to resubmit it uh, if say is very transparent uh, we can see where your actions at uh, and by we, I mean, you know, your HR professionals, commanders, and the member. So I can go into my absence request that I submitted, and I can see that it's with uh, Colonel Bingham, and he's waiting to approve it uh, kind of thing. Um, and, you know, higher level commanders also can look down and see the audit trail there and see where it's at, uh, see if it was recommended approved. Uh, if it was approved, denied, or what have you. Um, and as these actions happen again, right, it's notifying the member through email and through their IPSA dashboard that this stuff is happening. Uh, so very transparent. No more lost leave forms. I know where my leave is set in, or I know that it was approved within, uh, you know, 60 seconds, what have you. Uh, and then looking here at the bottom right, so working with HQDA policy, um, the regulation holder and uh, general officer decisions at the HQDA level, uh, we have built the system to where if the supervisor uh, is identified and has the appropriate authority and approvals, uh, they can now approve your leave. Uh, again, they have to be given the role to do it. Uh, you know, the commander can give them that delegation to be able to approve leave uh, and it's kind of controlled that way. But we have built a system to allow them to be able to do that. And of course, your immediate commander, battalion commander is a hire. Uh, and then, you know, certain leaves have to go all the way to HQDA uh, level or HRC to be uh, approved there. Uh, and 
with every type of leave we have, we have very specific approval guidance um, built in to let the one supervisor or intermediate approver authorities know where these leaves need to go. So you don't have to go and research and look and look and look and talk to people on the HR professionals page on where they should go. We have the guidance there and we have some built in rules that if they do require these high level uh, of approvers that the system catches that and kind of forces that function to happen. So, you know, if it, it's over 30 days of leave and uh, maybe the battalion commander is supposed to be one to approve that, uh, it's going to stop me as the supervisor from being able to approve those. It's going to force it to be workflow to that higher level. All right, next, uh, next slide. OK, yep. Yeah. so now we're moving into uh, pay error resolution. Uh, you know, rejects happen all the time. I will say that we have uh, over a million transactions sent to DJMS RC and release two, and we currently stand at a 99.x percent uh, acceptance rating. Uh, but, you know, there's still that 0.8 percent uh, that rejects and we have to worry about. Um, and moving into release three, Right, our HR transition team is really working to ensure that uh, we can handle those issues that come up when they come up. Uh, again, I just, you know, nine FIDs we're sending uh, to DJMS AC uh, and then and 2018s to DJMS RC. Um, and this is kind of more focused on your active, active component, but we are also working with our reserve component um, to work out their details as well. Uh, but really here, you know, your HR professionals at the S1 uh, Battalion Brigade, uh, we have uh, built some reports called a submitted FIDS report and a submitted TINS report that show all of the transactions that have been sent to DJMS for that day's transactions. So as, you know, again, special pays, absences, assignments, stuff like that that trigger these uh, transactions to go to DJMS, you can pull a report and see exactly what is being sent there. It looks very similar kind of the way a drop report looks today, uh, but we've also built a more enhanced version of that um, that kind of translates those data elements into uh, real words really. And this is so uh, HR community can pull it, see exactly what those 80 character formats are saying, uh, and they can ensure that again, their transactions were sent. And then if there's, the transaction wasn't sent, uh, then they can start doing what we call root cause analysis, right? Maybe uh, something potentially could be wrong with that interface kind of thing. Uh, there could be an action that they thought was approved, but actually had not been approved yet um, or what have you. So they're kind of looking at that front end there to make sure that everything is good there. And then the other side of it, your service and finance office, um, you know, your AMPOs, your FEMSUs for National Guard and Reserve, the USARC uh, G8 and the uh, USPFOs for National Guard, they are kind of unique, right? So they have access to DJMS to look at a member's pay record in release two and release three, uh, but we're also going to have them have access to look in IPSA, uh, you know, it'll be read only, they don't transaction IPS, but they'll be able to look at the different type of orders that are produced, uh, pay requests that are done. And working with DFAST, we actually did a uh, SCR uh, with them. So now all of the transactions that get sent to DJMS, they can pull an individual report, uh, you know, reject report, recycles, management notices to see what IPSA transactions were sent based on their uh, uh, ADD, they're basically the members of the service. Uh, and as things reject, they will, you know, work with their S1s in the beginning. It'll be a daily sync, really, meeting between them two to one, see if the issue is front end of IPSA or uh, uh, was the transaction done correctly in IPSA and maybe there's a data that's uh, wrong in DJMS and how to correct that, whether it needs to be direct input in DJMS itself, 
uh, or again, fix the transaction in Ipsa and resend it there. Uh, and then that team is also working on a payer resolution guide that really lays out the details of each transaction um, and how they uh, work individual rejects based on historical data. Um, next slide. Yeah, so this is this is just kind of a flow chart. The bottom swim lanes, uh, you know, the Regatus 1, Ampo, FEMSU, that's what we just talked through uh, really in the previous slide. Uh, but really the top here is IPSA and HRC with the CRM module uh, doing concurrent reject analysis. So as the fields reviewing their rejects that happen and what's going on there, our program is also looking in at it from the back end every single day. So we want to make sure that one, our logic's up to date as we update if say uh, that everything's integrating together like it's supposed to, uh, and also that there is as oh, I'm sorry, as things update in DJMS, uh, that our logic stays up to date with their changes. And if not, right, we can catch these uh, changes based on our reject analysis, update them uh, so future transactions go out correctly. Uh, and then also we are working with the field, um, you know, in the beginning, it would be often and then as things uh, again work out, we'll taper off. But we're always working with the field to let them know of potential issues that are happening, uh, how to mitigate those risks and proper procedures moving forward. Um, and again, so this lays out the active component. The next slide is very similar. Uh, if we can move to it, it's, it basically lays out the same thing, but for uh, the U.S. Army Reserves, uh, which is USARC G1 and USARC G8, which is the pay division there. And for our National Guard counterparts, it would be the uh, USPFOs uh, for their state or territory. Uh, so I do believe next we are going to go into a absence demo uh, pending any questions right now. Yes, yeah, start first class Lingerfeld real quick. Um, Major Wilcox would like to know, will the UCFR still be in play? Uh, yes, the UCFR will still be in play for release three. Um, because, you know, DJMS is the authoritative source for pay. Um, but we are looking at ways to integrate with that. And then, of course, uh, working on like a uh, financial health report and UCFR um, for IPSA and release four. This is going to be a demonstration of the absence management process within IPSA. We're going to look at the entry process from a member self-service perspective. We will also talk about the differences between doing the entry from a member self-service perspective and doing it from an S1 or supervisor perspective. The overall process is fundamentally the same. However, from an S1 supervisor commander perspective if you're doing that entry on the behalf of a member the only real difference is that you have to select the member first that you're intending to act upon so we're going to show that real quick and then we'll go back into the doing it from the member self-service perspective i've already logged into the system as the actors for this demonstration to avoid having to log out and log back in so i will be clicking through each of those entries as as we go through and i'll talk about it as i go but right now i want to show what it would look like if i'm coming in as a uh, hr specialist or a commander to come in and do an entry on behalf of a member so in this particular case i would i'm already logged in so i'm going to select hr professional i'm going to select absence management from the dashboard this is going to bring up a list of people that are within my purview now you don't have to scroll through this list in order to find the person that you're looking for, particularly if it's a large list that may take a while, you can simply come in and, and put in some part of the name that you are searching for. So in this case, we're looking for a Mark something. The entry that I'm intending to do is for Seth Markham. 
So as an S1 or commander supervisor, I can simply select that user and it will bring up now the absence management entry process. It works the same for if I'm trying to cancel or view or update absence requests. From this point forward, the entry process is fundamentally the same. With that, I am going to switch back over to doing this entry from a member self-service perspective. So I'm going to go back to the home page for this individual. And now I am already logged in as Seth Markham. I only have self-service options. And so I will select my absences from the member self-service dashboard. At this point, I have the same three options, request absence, cancel absence, and view update request. But I also have this the page for actually doing the entry. Now the absence type simply filters the options that you see for absence name. If you wanted to just start with absence name, you could select them from that list. However, as that list grows, the options change. You can filter down that list by selecting chargeable, non-chargeable, or administrative from the top. Now, the differences between those three type of absences is chargeable absence is the only one that actually hits your accrued balances. Those balances are not maintained within IFSA, but we will be sending transactions to DJMS to affect a member's balances for a chargeable absence. Your non-chargeable administrative are not balance affecting entries. So this demonstration, we're going to focus on the chargeable absence itself. But the entry process for all of them work fundamentally the same. There are some additional approval requirements based on the type of absence or the duration of absence that you're selecting. And that's the biggest difference between these various absence types. So selecting chargeable absence now so creates this list to only say, I'm doing an absence. When you select an absence name, if there is a message to pop up, for example, in this case, we are telling the user that if you are selecting an absence and the duration of that absence exceeds the number of days that you have currently accrued, that puts you in an advanced absence situation where you actually have a negative balance. If something happens while you are in that absence in a negative balance situation, it could actually go into an excess absence situation. So a member has to acknowledge that, so just simply select OK. Now, once they do that, they would select a reason. These reasons all have a little bit of difference in the maybe what the workflow is that's required for them. There are additional messaging that, that can pop up. So for example, as an emergency absence, we would get this message saying, please support or please attach any supporting documentation for defendants for this type of an emergency. But every absence has that capacity to have its own individual messaging. In this particular case, we're going to only select the ordinary absence, and we're going to take off for Thanksgiving. But we're going to say that we're going to take off the 26th. At this point, you can either key in the end date, select the end date, just like we select the start date, or you can put in a duration. So if you put in five days, the system is automatically going to adjust that to the end date to 1130. What you may have noticed is the date of departure and the date of return also reflect the same start and end date. These dates are important. So in the event that I have worked my shift, so to speak, on the 25th, you know, I've worked all day. Maybe I worked till three o'clock in the afternoon. I got approval from my supervisor to be able to go ahead and leave early. Well, that's what that date of departure is for. So it allows you to be accountable but not charged for the 25th. Notice that if I make a mistake and I put that in as the 27th, the system knows that it cannot be after the start date. So you, you do have to put in a date that is prior to the start date or equal to. So in this case, we're going to say, I'm, I'm going to work my day on the 25th, but I am going to leave right after work on the 25th. The same works for the date of return. If I'm returning on a non-duty day or, or something like that, um, well, then you can select a date of return that, that actually is after the, the date of the end date of that absence. In this case, we're going to leave it at the 30th. Um, now, the supervisor ID. If you know your supervisor ID's number, you can simply key it in. However, most people aren't going to know that, so they would do a selection. What the system is going to do is, is going to find any supervisor that has the approval 
roles and supervisor commander roles within your organization. So it is looking at the organization that you are in and the UIC directly above you. So the department right above the department that you're currently in. Anybody that meets that criteria will show up in this list. In this case, we have two. And so I'm going to select Vince Goodson as my initial approver. Some absences require multiple approvers, others do not. So in this particular case, it will, it will route initially to Vince Goodson, Captain Goodson here. And at that point, if the approval guidance requires an additional approval, Vince would be responsible for putting in whoever that approval is. Or if just the workflow or notification is necessary that Vince needs it to go to somebody else, he has that, that same option. Um, so we're going to say, uh, put in some comments. Now, the contact information, I'm going to scroll down a little bit so we can see all of this. The contact information is where and who it is that you're going to go see. In this particular case, we're going to put in, you know, Grant's mother or Seth's mother. And uh, cell phone number, of course, that's not the real number. Now, what you will notice about the address is if it has an asterisk, those particular fields are required. Address line two and three are not required. You don't have to put anything in there. The system will accept it, but you don't have to put anything in. The geolook code is a, is a searchable item. So we're just going to collect search. What this actually is, it will give you places within the United States and, and throughout the world. and it will auto-populate the country, state, city, and county for that particular location. Most people are not going to know what that code is, but you can easily search for the, the city, state, or, or country, uh, and, and city name. So in our case, we're going to go to Weatherford, Oklahoma, and add in the postal. At this point, we could attach whatever it is that we wanted to attach to this to support why we're taking that absence. Um, if things are required, so for example, when we did the emergency, you know, we selected the emergency absence that says you need to, you need to attach that. Um, if you route that through approval without that attachment, there's a real good chance that they're going to decline it and send it back to you to attach the, the required documentation. At this point, we have it all filled out. And we're simply going to submit it. You can save it for later and, and come back to it uh, if necessary. So maybe you needed to go get some documentation to attach to it, where you can save it and then come back in and attach that documentation. And when I submit this, the system is automatically going to route it to the supervisor that we selected here. So we say yes, we want it to go, at which point the system is now going out and setting that workflow, setting those notifications. Uh, when I say notifications, we have both email notifications and the notification flag, the approval flag that shows up in the members homepage. Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna wait for the system to catch up here just a little bit because I know the demo is running a little bit longer. So where, where this takes us to is that that presented the pretty simple process of how absences are going to work. The amazing thing is that you can actually, soldiers are going to be able to do that from their mobile device as well. So we, we've built the system to have the capability for HR professionals to go in and build leave forms or for uh, commanders to build leave forms or absence requests for soldiers. But the reality is we shouldn't have to do that very often as HR professionals because soldiers will have the capability to do that as they sit in their car getting ready to depart on this emergency leave that they needed to take and they can submit that absence right there from their mobile device. So to do that though, they have to go to TRADOC and download the, the, the mobile device. And right here, this slide, which will be posted in this uh, site will have, has the instructions of where you need to go to download that site or that app and give you instructions on how to do that. So as we, the Army moves to a more transparent 
way of doing business and a more mobile way to get soldiers to not wait in that line that that Sar Martinez was talking about earlier in this uh, briefing. They have to download the app so they can do this. And the key is they can do it on any type of device um, and, and they'll just log in with their long strong password and be able to do certain actions. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? And so speaking of those actions, these are the things that soldiers can do inside of the mobile app uh, without a cat card. They just have to sign in with their long strong password, their DS login. A lot of soldiers don't ever remember this because they don't use it very often. However, now you'll have a reason to because you can get into your mobile app every day if you choose to manage your record using your uh, your DS login. And you can do all these different types of actions inside of the system, everything from submitting the leave the absence request to submitting personal action requests and e even doing awards through the system. So it's really going to get commanders and soldiers and leaders away from their desk when it comes to administrative support and be able to do things uh, in a more mobile state. Uh, there are just a few things that you still have to require a cat card and that's for the DD-93s and uh, approving certain actions where HR professionals and commanders will have to do that. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. So the only other thing I really wanted to um, push on is data correctness. So as we move along, IPSA is coming, it's coming fast. I mean, we we were just talking about designing this, it seems just uh, a few months ago, and here we are running into, we're almost into March, and we're gonna deliver this system to the field in December. So training's coming here in the summer, and in the late summer and, and early fall. So what we need the soldiers and HR professionals to do is really get after data correctness. The, the IPSA team is, is pushing out a monthly data quality assessment report to the field, to all units, so they can go look at, at what key data elements we need the field to, to correct in the legacy system so we have a smooth transition in December. So this just lists out some of the tasks we need we need help with, and and when I say we, I mean you, because the harder the the less you do in your side, the harder it'll be for for units moving into the future. So, soldiers need to go in and and check their mill connect, make sure data's right, check their SRB and ORBs, do everything they can in the system today while we have the legacy systems up and running to get that information right. Uh, make sure their training records are right with their APFT uh, height weight. Uh, weapons qualification, all those things that tie directly to promotions. Because as IPSA rolls out, it's also going to roll into doing a lot of automatic things that used to take HR professionals going and manually doing. Well, IPSA is going to do it automatically by syn synchronizing with di different data sources to make that system more streamlined. But we need the data to be right. So to help us make sure that we transition very smoothly in December and and we can all have a good Christmas this year, um, I, I'd ask you to work with your HR professionals, your soldiers and commanders, go out there and get, get that data quality assessment report for your organization, see what you need to do now to get the information as correct as possible. So when we pull data over, uh, it'll be a, an easy transition because updating the data on the back end uh, will be a little more tedious than we want it to be. Pending any questions on this, um, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you, Harper. Thank you, sir. So quick rundown. Um, we are all over social media. We have an Ipsy website. We're on Mill Suite S1 Net. Um, our YouTube page will have all of the videos that were showcased today, as well as many, many more. Um, so please check us out. And if you ever have questions, there's so many platforms you can reach out to us on. We're so happy to talk about the program and what you can expect moving forwards. Um, so I'll go to the next slide, please. And so as we wrap up, we're going to post a roll up of all of the Q&A that took place over the course of this Ipsy Live and we're going to put it in our Facebook closed group. So the closed group has, there's information on the slide currently of how you can join if you're not already a member. It's a great resource where people are asking real-time questions of how they can do certain parts in the system, ways to connect with soldiers who are currently in the system, and find lots of ac access and resources to things like user guides. And um, it's a great, great place to find out more information about IPSA in a smaller, more confined space. 
Um, so again, you can find information on the website listed above, and then we'll go to the next slide, please. So our next IPSA Live is 29 March. Um, more information will be coming out, so please keep an eye out. Um, thank you so much for joining today's IPSA Live session. We have one last slide before we end. So this slide is just uh, a QR code to download today's slides in case uh, you'd like a copy. We also dropped it in the chat link and then will also be available on our website, but just another access point. So again, thank you so much for joining us and um, have a great afternoon. We'll see you next month.